Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential string sextets for beginners. Now, a string sextet is almost an orchestral formation. You have two violins, two violas, and two cellos, which means that each pair of instruments can play in thirds or, or you know, make, make sort of quasi-harmony within its own little group and also blend and mix marvelously with everybody else in the string ensemble. It's a very rich sound. You know, string quartets are known for having, you know, because they have just four players where each part is supposed to be absolutely essential and, and, and there, there's no padding. Well, string sextets are padded, but just a little, just enough to give a little nice, schmoozy, cushy, warm feeling to the sound. Although in later works, it can be, of course, considerably more acerbic. It depends on the composer's own style. But this list of 10 works is a wonderful, wonderful introduction to chamber music that, that isn't going to come with the sort of, you know, snobby, quasi-intellectual patina that string quartets come with, rightly or wrongly. I mean, I think it's wrong. String quartets are like fabulous. You, you know, we, we've talked about some of them already in this series. But I think sextets have a certain special quality. There aren't lots of them. It's, it's a fairly, fairly uh, kind of rare chamber music formation. Part of the problem is just because in order to play them, you need to have a string quartet with a couple extra players. And you need an extra viola and an extra cello. So there, there aren't any regularly formed existing sextets to play that repertoire because the repertoire isn't large. I mean, if everyone wrote sextets, there would be zillions of sextets around playing the stuff. But it's not like quartets. They're special. And so, and so they get performed when you hire extra people, which costs more money, which, you know, but none of that matters as far as recordings goes. So let's talk about these 10 sextets. First, we begin with the composer Luigi Boccherini. Now, Boccherini invented the string sextet, as far as we know. He was the first major composer to write for that formation, and he wrote a series of six of them, his Opus 23, and they are lovely. Like, like everything by Boccherini, Boccherini was what we call in the business a chord guy. In the classical music universe, we tend to divide things in gross generalizations into line guys and chord guys. Line guys are interested in counterpoint, in multiple individual parts that, that you can hear sort of separately doing their thing, whereas chord guys are interested in vertical sonority, in richness of harmony, and in the, the seductive timbre of the ensemble. And Boccherini was the ultimate in that kind of, that kind of composer. He, his, his, his writing is extremely detailed, full of dynamic nuance, much more so than his contemporaries. And he was writing this stuff around the, the 1770s. So, I mean, to give you a sense of it, he lived until about 1802, somewhere in there. And he was one of the founders of the classical chamber music tradition, string quartets, quintets, and other works like that. But as far as sextet go, sextets go, he was, he was one of the very, very first. And they're beautiful, beautiful works. Sensual and, and, and sophisticated and just delightful. So I, I recommend them very strongly if you get a chance to hear them. Uh, you should try and give them a shot. They are, again, his string sextets, Opus 23. And there are six of them. They're not terribly long, but they are beautifully written for string instruments. He was a cellist himself which is always good when someone is a low string player because it means, first of all, they'll give a lot of attention to the bass lines and they'll not just write everything for the first violin. They'll give other people things to do, which means there'll be a lot more timbral interest for the work in whole, as a whole. So yes, Boccherini is great. Next, the next two both belong to Brahms. He wrote two sextets, his Opus 18 and exactly Opus 36, which turned out to be very, very lucky numbers. You know, in, in Jewish numerology, in gematria, these are magic numbers. The number 18 is the number chai. Chai is, 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 means life. It's the number of life. It's the numerical value of the two Hebrew letters that make up the word chai, which is a chet yud or something like that. So you get 18 and twice chai is 36. So there you go. So, so Brahms wrote two sextets with this magic number. 
I have no idea if you knew anything about that, but it's cool all the same. The first is in B flat major, and it's a lovely early work full of gushing, singing tunes. You know, Brahms wrote three string quartets, but he supposedly wrote like 15 or 20 others, all of which he destroyed because he was so hung up on the sophistication of the string quartet medium that he kept working at it and working at it and it drove him crazy. You get a sense with these sextets that it all just came out with total ease and they're just as formally perfect and shapely as the string quartets, only they're so much more tuneful and enjoyable and, and relaxed because with those extra strings, he wasn't so obsessed with perfect part writing and counterpoint and all of that stuff that string quartets tend to neurotically induce in some composers, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and then the second string sextet, which is like one of my favorite pieces of chamber music in the whole universe is so beautiful. And I did a big series of talks um, for beginners on how to listen to great music in which I talk about this sextet movement by movement all four movements individually, and then we put it all together. So if you want to take a look at those videos, please do. I think you'll get a lot out of them and you'll get to hear the entire sextet. It has the most fabulous tune in the first movement. Oh my God. Yada, yada, da, 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 yada, da. I mean, I, lovely, wasn't it? No, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. So the two Brahms sextets are essential and, and some of the most beautiful chamber music he wrote. And Brahms was most of all, as an instrumental composer, a chamber music composer. So the sooner you get into Brahms' chamber music, the sooner you'll get into Brahms. And I really mean that. I, you know, the, the, the best of him is in his chamber music, I think. Anyway, Dvorak wrote a gorgeous sextet in A major that has a fabulous theme and variations finale, which is lots of fun, and a, a zippy, zippy sort of dance-like movement called a scherzo, which means joke, but it's a dance-like movement that took the place of the classical minuet. And the central part of that you can hear in the first Slavonic dance. yum pa 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 yum pa 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 It's just lovely, absolutely lovely. And, it, you know, it's the only sextet Dvorak wrote, and he was a big string player, a string chamber music guy. He wrote 14 string quartets. So, so it shows you just how rare the string sextet is and, and how special the single examples by so many composers can really be. After Dvorak, we have the composer Joachim Raff. Now, Raff was a Swiss composer. He was a colleague of Liszt, he supposedly helped Liszt with his orchestration on his tone poems and other things. Raff wrote tons and tons and tons and tons of music. I mean, there's like a dozen or more symphonies and, and, and he just wrote scads of music. And because of that, he has a reputation for being a note spinner, someone who just chugged things out and didn't pay much attention and was kind of shallow and, and uninteresting. And, and he could be like everybody who was incredibly prolific. Um, there, there is, his output is variable, but his string sextet, which is, is in G minor, opus 178, which tells you where you are with him. There's a lot of stuff there is a lovely, lovely work because like I said, when most composers come to write string sextets, they make them special. And Raff is absolutely no exception. It's a lovely work. Another stunningly beautiful work is Tchaikovsky's string sextet subtitled Souvenir of Florence. Souvenir de Florence. It is glorious. It's often performed in a larger formation for string orchestra, not just for string sextet, because the textures are so rich and it's so full of, you know, that kind of, that kind of warm romantic melody that Tchaikovsky is really famous for. And so it tends to gush. And if you add more strings, it gushes even more, but it sounds fabulous in its original version for string sextet. And I have to say, I have to say, you know, Tchaikovsky is not known as a composer of chamber music, and this is probably his greatest work as a chamber music composer. He wrote three string quartets. He wrote a couple of piano trios and some other things like that. But this, this sextet, the Souvenir of Florence, is as magnificent a piece as anybody wrote in the 19th century. And it's Tchaikovsky at his very, very finest. So you really will want to hear that if you love Tchaikovsky and you're curious about what he might have done in the chamber music medium. And again, the fact that he has those extra strings, it helps him. 
It just helps him. It helps him to be himself in the chamber music medium. Now, moving up a few, there is Korngold. Korngold was a child prodigy, probably the greatest since Mozart and Mendelssohn. They were sort of tied. Um, but Korngold is famous as a film music composer. But before he went to Hollywood and wrote, you know, Robin Hood and, and, and Captain Blood and all these adventure movie film scores, he was, he was a Viennese composer of opera primarily, and he wrote a lot of instrumental music too. When he was a kid, I mean, he was like 15. Or and he wrote a lovely string sextet that is well worth your time and attention. The idiom is a little bit more modern. It's more chromatic. That is, it's, it's less obviously tuneful in the sense, but it's, it's splendidly written and it has plenty of tunes in it. Don't get me wrong. But the harmonic idiom is a little more elusive. And so you're getting into the 20th century. And some people prefer that kind of thing and some people don't. I'm not one to judge. You will decide yourself. After Korngall, we have Schoenberg, <clears throat> the fearsome Arnold Schoenberg, who invented 12-tone writing and atonality and all of that stuff. And it was reviled ever since. Schoenberg was a fascinating composer. He was a tough guy. I mean, his music is all designed to be confrontational in a way. But one of his most popular pieces, and some of them really are popular, is Transfigured Night. It's called Verklärte Nacht in German. This is a 30 minute long tone poem um, for string sextet. Now it's much more famous in its version for full string orchestra, which Schoenberg himself made. So it was, it was him, but again, it shows the almost orchestral tendencies of the string sextet medium, you know, because of its, of its richness of sound. So Verklärte Nacht is, is this big heavy tone poem and it's about I don't know, some woman wandering around and she's pregnant with another guy's kid and her boyfriend, you know, understands it. And he's going to forgive her and there are moonbeams striking her uterus. And I, he, he, you can read the poem if you want. The music itself is full of surging, yearning and passion. And it's all in a very, very troubled, chromatic, unsteady D minor key. But then when the, the transfiguration happens, when the moonbeam hits her uterus, whatever, it all, the atmosphere clears and it's just magical. Absolutely magical. It's one of the great moments in, in late 19th century, early 20th century music. Um, and it's a great work. So uh, lots of people love Verklaire Nacht who wouldn't touch any of Schoenberg's later music. So that's definitely worth hearing. Then there are two composers who are both Czech, who you probably won't know very well. One is Irvin Schulhoff. Now Schulhoff was one of those Czech Jewish composers who was murdered by the Nazis. Um, and he actually, I think, died of tuberculosis in the Theresienstadt concentration camp or somewhere around there, or in one of the concentration camps. He was a fabulously talented composer. He became a dyed-in-the-wool socialist slash communist and started writing sort of socialist realist music. But before that, um, he also wrote a lot of, he was just creative. You know, and, and so they, you know, he had a style that they called Dadaist, kind of crazy, halluc hallucinatory. He used jazz, he used Czech folk music. And his string sextet, Opus 45, is one of those brilliant, sort of spiky, interesting 20th century works. It's a bit neoclassical, and that is in a sense that it, it has driving rhythms and, and clear, tangy harmonies. And I, it's just wonderful. A wonderful piece that if you're interested in the string sextet medium, you'll want to hear, as is the string sextet by Czech composer Bohuslav Martinu, who wrote tons of everything, but again, one string sextet. And it's another neoclassical piece, um, similar to the Schulhoff, actually, I mean, in terms of its, its aesthetic. That is, it's not very long, it's not terribly involved in terms of its it's, it's expressive or intellectual pretensions. It's just fun to listen to. It's buoyant, rhythmic music full of bouncy tunes and syncopated, syncopated rhythm. And oh, it's just marvelous. It's lots of fun. And it's, again, oh, you can find all of these things like on YouTube and in various places like that. So you can sample or if you have streaming services, you can download them. They are all worth your time and attention. The sextet medium is just marvelous and full of fantasy and melody and, and, and just deliciousness. It makes a wonderful introduction to chamber music. 
It really does. I, and and I, it's a pity that these works tend to be terribly underrated and underexposed because they often represent the best of what each composer was capable of in the chamber music medium. So there you go. Give them a shot. See what you think. And as with all these beginners lists, by the way, if you know them all, you have your own ideas, leave them out. Ten is enough. This is the list. Do not suggest anything else, please. Let's just leave it at this and give everybody a chance to really let this music sink in and make its impression. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.